It is my great honor to address such a distinguished audience at this institution that embraces such noble purpose as the promotion of international peace among the nations of the world. In an effort to present a case for international peace from the Costa Rican approach, I would like to comment a very brief story of Costa Rica's demilitarization, illustrating the value proposition of what this means to us as a nation and what it represents to the world. Also, I would like to exemplify some benefits of this decision and present some challenges that lie ahead for the international community in terms of peace and disarmament and conclude with some final considerations of what demilitarization means for international peace in the world we live in today. In 1948, Costa Rica was the scenario of a socio-political unrest that originated from an allegedly fraudulent electoral process. This led to a confrontation that became violent and both parties resorted to weapons to fight for what they considered their legitimate right. A man by the name Jose Figueres Ferrer became the leader of the National Liberation Army, which was a, par a paramilitary army of 700 men, some of which were foreigners from neighboring Latin American countries. This contingent was poorly armed and trained, but in 44 days managed to defeat the National State Army and instate what became known as the founding junta of the Second Republic. During 18 months, Figueres Ferrer himself led a process through which Costa Rica issued a new constitution, including some paramount reforms that have shaped the country's idiosyncrasy ever since. One of these reforms was the permanent abolishment of the state military army. History offers a particular view about this event within the circumstantial perspective of the time. As it has been stated before, this was a weak, poorly armed military body. Abolishing it did not imply a particularly large political cost. There was not going to be much opposition to the decision, especially after being defeated by a group of poorly trained and armed men. It is said that Figueres Ferrer inspired his decision on a quote by H.G. Wells' book, The Outline of History, which says that the future of mankind cannot include armed forces. Police, yes, because people are imperfect. He aimed at creating a society that would reach a higher level of civilization in which conflicts would never be dealt with through the violence of firearms. This historical decision has had profound repercussions domestically as well as abroad. For once, all nations around the world, most particularly our immediate neighboring countries of Nicaragua and Panama, have the certainty that Costa Rica will never resort to military power as a way to solve conflicts across borders. Perhaps the most tangible example of this reality is the present border conflict that Costa Rica and Nicaragua are facing since October 2010. An occupation of Nicaraguan military troops into Costa Rican territory triggered an international campaign by Costa Rican diplomacy, both to legitimize its right to vindicate its sovereignty and territorial claim, as well as to take action at the corresponding International Court of Justice at The Hague as its fundamental defense strategy. Would Costa Rica have had an army, it is likely to imagine that it would have been deployed to fight the aggression by force. Although there were some isolated cries for militarization in the wake of this conflict, no one in Costa Rica dares to suggest the name and location of the first soldier we would choose to see perish in combat. As Ryoichi Sasakawa once said, blessed is the Costa Rican mother who knows at the time of birth that her child will never be a soldier.
Looking back at Latin American history, one notorious difference between Costa Rica and many of its neighbors is that there has never been a military intervention in political or state affairs. If a foreign power would have wanted to infiltrate the military to influence political leadership in a country, as it has happened so many times, this was never a possibility in Costa Rica. This has provided a solid political stability that has guaranteed since 1948 that all political disputes have been solved in accordance with constitutional rules. As I have said before, not having an army is a guarantee to the international community, most in particular to our immediate next door neighbors, that they will never receive a military aggression from Costa Rica. This is why it is said that Costa Rica has waged peace on the world. A third remarkable benefit of demilitarization for Costa Rica has been the possibility to reallocate military spending towards more virtuous and humane purposes, such as healthcare, education, and environmental conservation. Costa Rica has embraced education as a pillar towards development since the 1880s, as well as healthcare to all inhabitants of the country, be they indigenous or migrant, regardless of their legal status through a world-renowned universal healthcare system. Regarding environmental conservation, the country is well known internationally as an active promoter of sustainable development, ecological tourism, renewable energies, and biodiversity. This is why it is said that Costa Rica, after waging peace on the world, has also waged peace on nature. A few decades ago, civil wars were present in three Central American countries. A peace plan presented by Costa Rica before the international community resulted in strong political commitments from all Central American governments to make all necessary efforts to restore peace. As a result, former Costa Rican President Oscar Arias Sanchez was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 1987. Also as a result, civil wars were eradicated from the region with relative political stability since then. Today, the challenges faced by the region also have to do with armed violence. Six of the seven most violent countries in the world in 2011 are in the Caribbean basin of Latin America, and three of those are in Central America. These homicide epidemics represent the greatest obstacle to development in the region, without a doubt the most violent region in the world today. Although this has no relation with institutionalized demilitarization, it represents an urgent need to disarm extremely violent populations that show no respect for human life. On a positive note, Panama has taken the decision a few years back to abolish its military army, which means that Costa Rica shares with its southern neighbor perhaps the safest border in the world with no military presence on either side of the international border. Precisely another challenge of demilitarization today is the urgency to patrol borders and domestic waters against drug trafficking. Central America and Mexico are the natural bridge of heavy narcotics that are trafficked between South America and North America. This has created an illegal market economy of storage distribution and sale of drugs that has corrupted millions of people in the region, pushing them towards violent crime to earn a living and die young. The drug war in Mexico, in which the military army has been fighting drug lords and cartels over the past five years, has rendered nearly 50,000 deaths. It is questionable whether military intervention has been successful. Inevitably, the question looms large about what are alternatives to such intervention by the use of force. Moreover, at a global level, remilitarization is an increasingly worrisome situation. 
By 2010, the world has managed to reach an amount of military spending of $1.6 trillion. The question is, which enemy is it that military armies are preparing to fight against? It makes one wonder if they are aware of human-made environmental challenges that already represent a serious threat to civilization as we know it. And yet there is no military army that can fight a battle that knows no borders and that could affect water supplies and fertility of agricultural production to feed all of humanity. This is a question that has to be dealt with ethically. What is the kind of civilization we expect to build? How much do we wish to embrace peaceful coexistence? In 2006, Costa Rica presented the Costa Rica Consensus. The idea consisted on proposing that the countries that more decidedly reduced their military spending would be the ones to rank higher on the list of countries subject to receiving foreign development aid. Unfortunately, this was not an idea deemed virtuous or of merit by the international community. It is no coincidence that the five permanent members of the United Nations Security Council are the biggest sellers of weapons and armament worldwide. They would likely disagree with any international treaty that would promote reduction of military expenditure. Also in 2006, Costa Rican President Oscar Arias Sanchez led an initiative by a group of Nobel Peace Laureates to present what has become known as the Arms Trade Treaty, which was adopted at the United Nations General Assembly as Resolution 61-89 towards an Armed Trades Treaty, establishing common international standards for the import, export, and transfer of conventional arms. Along with Costa Rica, Japan is among the original co-authors of the resolution. The passing of this resolution counted with support of 153 countries, with 24 abstentions and only one vote against by the United States of America, who is responsible for $55 billion a year in international trade of conventional firearms. In October 2009, President Barack Obama overturned his country's former position, granting support to such an international treaty. As of September 2011, 58 US senators opposed the treaty, representing a sufficient number to block any such treaty from being ratified by the United States. As the 21st century moves along into a far more integrated and interconnected global society that at present counts 7 billion inhabitants and is projected to reach 9 billion by 2050, other global challenges will become far more relevant, such as the availability of forests to clean the air we breathe and the water we drink, availability of sanitary conditions, such as clean water for all the world's population, availability of fertile lands and oceans to grow our food resources, such as agricultural crops and fisheries to feed us all, and availability of human security not threatened by climate-related catastrophes. Putting our guns down would be an ethical step towards building global trust to get our heads and hearts around dealing effectively with far greater issues than military confrontation. This calls on peaceful nations like Japan, like Costa Rica, to lead the way by example. As Johann Galtung reminds us, Peace is the ability to transform conflicts creatively, empathically, and harmoniously. This is the aim of Costa Rican nation and the aspiration of Costa Rica to the world. Thank you.